Uh, but I'm going to start with a short personal story, my uh, own metaphor, if, if you will, and you can make of it what you want. So, um, in the summer of 2015, uh, on a Thursday evening in late July, to be precise, I tripped and fell into a ditch on the island of Anglesey, which is in North Wales, and I found myself face to face with a dozen beautiful Welsh potted orchids. So I was on the promontory at Penmon, which is the site of a healing sanctuary blessed in the 6th century by a saint named Seriol. I felt that the orchids had been sent to me uh, by the saint himself, in whose well, and uh, his well, I had just dipped my weary feet. Indeed, the fall happened at the very end of our usual week of vacation on the island where I have family, on the year when I decided, in a rather whimsical way, that I would become a, an orchid hunter. I knew that Anglesey hosted several species of orchids, and I'd been told at the beginning of the week uh, by a nature guide that the orchids were late blooming that year, so uh, end of July is very late actually for orchids, and I had a good chance to, to spot them. Well, I spent uh, five days walking with my eyes on the ground without finding a single one of the flowers. And I had all but abandoned my quest when the serendipitous fall occurred. I had found my holy grail. Since that summer, so four years ago, uh, I have be become uh, much more adept at finding and recognizing orchids. Uh, in fact, now uh, I can spot an orchid in a rather large meadow uh, from quite a distance uh, to the, the great annoyance of my, my family. I have, I have fallen prey to a mild form of orchidomania or uh, orchid delirium, as the uh, Victorians would call it. And I take my consolation uh, in the fact that I am far from alone. There's a proliferation of books on orchids. Uh, the three uh, there were published in the last three years. And um, every single author, and I have to say they're often men, uh, acknowledge that the attraction of orchids is partly linked to their association with sexuality. So put bluntly, Orchid flowers are reminiscent of a vulva, and here is um, how uh, Georgia O'Keeffe uh, represented the orchid flower. Um, and uh, the orchid tuber, so the, the root, is um, reminiscent of testicles. So fascination with orchids is, of course, not a new phenomenon, and it has roots in the distant past. Uh, probably well before the Greeks and the Romans uh, ever wrote anything, but today I'm going to explore the, the use of orchids as aphrodisiacs and also as anaphrodisiacs in Greek and Roman antiquity. And the, in doing so, I will encounter other ingredients with uh, similar perceived properties, both vegetable and animal. And I will suggest that orchids, like other alleged aphrodisiacs, were meant to ignite the wilderness in civilized humans and also in domesticated animals. So the Greeks and Romans distinguished, so they, uh, they, uh, di yeah, they, they distinguished two main types of orchids, the orchis and the saturion. Um, and those are almost impossible to map onto uh, modern species, so people have tried, but it's, it's very difficult to do so. Uh, but what these uh, two types of orchids have in common is that they have aphrodisiac properties. Uh, and those properties are advertised in the very name of the plant. So the primary meaning uh, of the Greek word orchis is testicle, uh, as in uh, a male testicle. And a saturian uh, refers to the satyrs, who are uh, very uh, sexual uh, divinities. So I'm, I'm going to uh, take those two types of orchids uh, one at a time. So our earliest description of the orchids, so uh, the first type of orchid, uh, comes from uh, the Inquiry into Plants, uh, which was written by Theophrastus in the 4th century BC, 
And uh, Theophastus is uh, one of the students of uh, Aristotle and is often uh, called the father of botany. So uh, Theophastus writes uh, in this part of a, a longer passage uh, and he says, by bodily powers, I mean fertility and infertility. Some plants have the power to produce both from the same source, as in the case of the orchis. For these have two tuberous roots, the one larger, the one smaller. The large one makes a person more effective in intercourse when given in the milk of a mountain pastured goat, but the smaller harms and prevents intercourse. So that uh, passage is, um, the, so this snippet is actually part of a much longer passage, uh, which is actually not to be found in the most frequently read edition of Theophrastus, which is the, the Loeb edition uh, by Sir Arthur Hort, which was published in 1926. So um, it's not uncommon in ancient texts to have uh, passages that are deemed uh, not, uh, um, uh, they, they, they lack propriety. Uh, and often what uh, the uh, editors in the 19th century and the early 20th century did is to translate into Latin Greek passages. And when uh, they had Latin passages that they found difficult, they translated them into Italian. But um, Hort uh, opted for a more radical solution, and he didn't pre print the Greek text at all, and he didn't translate it. Nevertheless, he included the word orchis in his index, leaving a clue uh, to the readers uh, as to what they might be missing. So the, the orchis uh, possesses opposite powers, the aphrodisiac and anaphrodisiac. So the principle that is, play, that is at play here is that of similars are uh, a cure for similars. So if you give something that looks like a big testicle uh, to someone, then it's going to have an aphrodisiac effect on that person. If you give something uh, that looks like a shriveled small testicle to someone, that's going to be an aphrodisiac. Um, so the, and, and the liquid uh, that is recommended for uh, the aphrodisiac <laughs> orchid root is the milk of a mountain pastured goat. So that substance is, of course, not ch um, chosen randomly. So the goat uh, was an animal reputed for its high sexual drive in antiquity, and we'll uh, go back to goats, and I was very happy to see in the opening film that there, there were goats. <laughs> Uh, and and mountains, uh, mountains, for their part, were associated with wilderness. So if you wanted a uh, plant that was highly pharmacological, so that was very powerful, what you did is go to a mountain and find plants. Um, and milk, of course, has clear associations with fertility uh, because it's usually, very, I mean, in most cases, produced after a pregnancy. So in ancient science, milk was believed to be concocted menstrual blood. So what the ancients did is that they had observed that uh, female animals, included, uh, including women, uh, do not generally menstruate when pregnant or when lactating, or uh, at least at the, the very beginning of uh, lactation. And this made them conclude that menstrual blood was concocted during pregnancy into uh, the fetus's body and after birth uh, into breast milk. So um, the milk of a strong mountain wildish goat would then reinforce the aphrodisiac properties of the large uh, orchis. This makes a lot of sense. Um, Theophrastus does not say in what liquid you have to take the small anaphrodisiac uh, orchid root, but it's likely that it's actually the same liquid, so, so milk. Uh, because milk is an ambivalent substance, so it's clearly associated with fertility, it's clearly associated with sex, but there's also relatively strong taboos surrounding lactation in many societies, uh, including uh, Greek and Roman society. So uh, lactating women were discouraged from having sexual intercourse as they risked becoming pregnant, and that pregnancy would poison uh, their milk uh, and then pose a risk to their child. 
Several centuries after Theophrastus, Dioscorides, and Dioscorides is probably the most famous uh, uh, author uh, on pharmacology of antiquity. He was active in the, the first century AD, uh, and uh, his text, uh, Materia Medica, influenced uh, pharmacy until uh, the early modern period. Um, so Dioscorides uh, wrote the following about the Orcus. Orcus, but some call it dog's orcus, so dog's balls, basically. And about this plant, it is said that men who eat the larger root will uh, sire boys, but that women who eat the smaller root will give birth to girls. And it is said that women in Thessaly drink its tender shoots with goat's milk to arouse sexual desire and the dry ones to check and weaken sexual desires. So here, Dioscorides does something he often does. He distances himself from its sources, and he does that by the use of it is said. So uh, he reports things, but uh, he is hiding himself uh, behind the fact that, uh, that that's not what he has observed as some other people. Um, and there's a lot of similarities uh, between what he says, or what his sources say, and what Theophrastus uh, said, but there's, there's also differences. So here, the, uh, the, the tuber, uh, so the, the root, is used uh, to determine the sex of an unborn child. Uh, so this is one of the relatively rare examples of uh, one of the things you can allegedly do uh, in antiquity uh, to uh, produce uh, a boy or a girl. Um, and then um, he uh, also tells us that orchids shoots this time, so the, not the, uh, the root, but the shoot taken in goat's milk. So again, goats uh, are uh, aphrodisiac and uh, anaphrodisiac. Uh, and uh, he tells us that, uh, uh, he associates that, that practice of taking the shoot with the women of uh, Thessaly uh, who, uh, who uh, drink the, uh, the orchid shoots. So uh, Thessaly in antiquity was known as the land of the, of the witches. So when Dioscorides refers to these women of Thessaly, he's probably referring to uh, witches. Um, and when they uh, consumed tender shoots full of uh, milky sap, uh, they became aroused. And when they consumed the dry, shrivel, shriveled shoots, their uh, sexual lust was uh, quenched. So again, we have the principle of similars are uh, uh, a treatment for similars. So what I find very interesting in this passage is that it explicitly acknowledges sexual arousal in women. So the women of Thessaly, uh, they're not giving the potion to, to men to drink, uh, they are drinking it themselves. And that aphrodisiac is not the only one that is associated uh, with uh, women in the ancient world. So here's another example. So it's an example uh, that is preserved by Pliny the Elder, who is a, a, a Roman author of the first century CE but he's recording a recipe that is attributed to Xenocrates, uh, who was a, a Greek-speaking uh, uh, physician of the first century BC, and Xenocrates has a, has a reputation for liking magic uh, a little bit too much. And uh, so um, it says that mallows are so aphrodisiac, and uh, here's the mallow, that the stem of the single stem mallow sprinkled for the treatment of women augment the sexual longing indefinitely so Xenocrates maintains, and that three roots fastened next to the affected place have the same effect. So uh, here again, so it's, it's for uh, women, um, and, but I'd, I'd like to say that it's not uh, just for sexual pleasure as, uh, as sexual pleasure. Uh, so in antiquity, uh, sexual pleasure is meant to lead to uh, reproduction. So uh, we, we're dealing with societies that are highly uh, pronatalist. Um, but the, so the plant here, so the, um, the mallow, can be either uh, reduced to a powder and then sprinkled on or used as an amulet. So this is one of the ways in which plants were used. Uh, and here I digress a, a little bit because it's nothing to do with plants, but I, I couldn't resist. Uh, here are some examples of uh, amulets uh, that were used in ancient gynecology. So they, they, they're two different amulets, um, and, uh, but they, they have things in common. And the thing that they have in common is this uh, here, which uh, looks a bit like a, a cupping vessel, but is in fact a, uh, a womb. And here you have a sort of uh, Egyptian-looking divinity 
So these are amulets from uh, Roman Egypt. And this divinity is holding a key. Uh, and uh, so what happens is that you, uh, so the, the amulet is the key. And it works both ways. So you can either open uh, the womb, and that will leads, uh, leads to, uh, to becoming pregnant. Um, um, yeah, leads to becoming pregnant, and then you close it, and that keeps the, the, the embryo inside. And then when uh, the, the woman is in labor, and the labor becomes too long, too protracted, she can uh, again wear amulet, and hopefully uh, the divinity will uh, open the key, uh, and uh, uh, the birth will uh, become easy. So let us uh, return to orchids. So the, um, <laughs> yeah, well, not quite. Uh, <laughs> the, the second group of uh, orchids identified by uh, the Greeks and Romans uh, were the, the Saturion. So the name Saturion uh, clearly uh, linked the plant with the, the lustful satire, the satyrs, sorry. Uh, so satyrs are, are wood divinities uh, that are associated with the gods Dionysus and Pan, uh, and they're represented as uh, hybrids uh, between a horse and a man in, uh, Greek, um, in Greek art. So here, this, this is a horse tail. Um, and uh, so you have a goat here, but uh, actually uh, the, the, the satyr is, is a horse and has a, an erection. And then in Roman art, they're usually represented as half a goat uh, and uh, half human. So they often have, have horns, uh, they're goat horns. Um, so according to Dioscorides, there were several types of uh, saturion, and there was a particularly powerful one that was the Erythraean uh, saturion. And it was so powerful uh, that um, merely holding it in one's hand would be effective, although it was uh, much more powerful when drunk in wine. And Pliny the Elder uh, added some uh, rather juicy detail. They tell us that sexual desire is aroused if the root is merely held in the hand, a stronger pa passion, however, if it is taken in a dry wine. That rams also and he goats are given it in drink when they are too sluggish, and that it is given to stallions from Samatia uh, when they are too fatigued in copulation because of prolonged labor. The effects of the plant can be neutralized by doses of idromel or lettuce. So here we learn two important things. So the first thing is that aphrodisiacs are not just for humans. They were also given to domestic animals, and in particular to horses. So horses in ancient literature are tricky animals, uh, and they're tricky because they don't reproduce uh, when they are asked to reproduce. So uh, it's difficult to get a stallion to mount a mare. Uh, it's difficult because mares are obsessed with themselves. They like flicking their hair. Uh, and, and stallions are also too obsessed with themselves and, uh, and, and too lazy to, to do the, the work. So, um, um, so, um, so we do have recipes for aphrodisiacs for horses. Uh, so I, I haven't got examples here, but we, we do have them, and, and they look very much like uh, those for, for humans. The second thing we learn is that the effect of saturion can be neutralized by uh, hydromel, which is a mixture of honey and water, and by lettuce. And lettuce is interesting. So lettuce was uh, a well, know, well known as a sleep inducer in antiquity. So, and uh, the, this property uh, was found uh, both in the seeds of the lettuce and also in the milky sap uh, that, uh, that gives the lettuce its name in Latin uh, and hence in, in, in English and other languages. So the, the name in Latin is uh, lactuca, uh, where lac means uh, milk. Um, so, and, and actually pharmacologists uh, continue to uh, use the lettuce um, as a, a sedative uh, and as an analgesic uh, until the beginning uh, of the 20th century, and actually they, they're still used in uh, some forms of uh, folkloric uh, medicine. And you might remember that uh, in Beatrix's Potter's Tale of the Flopsy Bunnies, the bunnies fall asleep after stuffing themselves with lettuce. Uh, sleep is, uh, of course, the worst enemy of sexual intercourse, uh, uh, and it would have made sense <laughs> 
to temper the aphrodisiac power of the saturian with a mild sedative, such as uh, lettuce sap uh, or seeds. And uh, here's a reminder that uh, Beatrix Potter was a very good uh, botanist, very accomplished, uh, and she, she drew a, a, a very beautiful drawings of plants. The, the Saturian orchid features in several ancient aphrodisiac recipes, which are slightly more complex than what we have seen uh, so far. And I'm going to give you one example here, which is a, a recipe uh, that is found in the writings of uh, Paula Vegina, who uh, was a medical writer in the 7th century uh, AD. So he writes, uh, so this is a recipe for a sexual uh, stimulant. And he says, Saturian, so the orchid, the penis of a deer, of each two drachmas or drams, Seed of rocket, pellitory, barley, wax of each two drams, turpentine, one dram, three eggs of sparrow, three geckos, pine or iris oil, a sufficient amount. Steep the live geckos in vinegar until 40 days have passed, smearing the vessel that contains the gecko with dung. So beside the, the powerful uh, orchids here, you have several uh, vegetable ingredients, and I'm not going to uh, describe their, their properties in detail, but uh, you, for instance, you could uh, single out the, the iris, which looks like, a, uh, like, a, like an orchid. Uh, it, it also has uh, flowers that are quite uh, uh, sexual. Uh, and then you have deer's penis, gecko, sparrow's eggs, and dung. So, so I leave the, the, deco for, the gecko for last. Um, and but I, I go through the, the others. So both the, the sparrow's eggs and the deer penis are quite uh, obviously sexually connotated. So the, the egg is female and, uh, uh, and the deer uh, penis is, is male. So you have a, a balance of male and, and female uh, powers. Um, the, the sparrow was uh, a bird that was associated with the goddess Aphrodite, the, the goddess of love. Uh, so uh, uh, in, in myth, uh, a chariot is uh, sometimes drawn by sparrows, uh, and uh, acolyte Cupid also rode on sparrows. So here is a, a oops, a, a classical. Uh, so this is from the classical period. This is Aphrodite with a bird. This is this is not a sparrow. Uh, it looks like a seagull, but it's probably a dove. And here's a, a Victorian image of a Cupid uh, on a sparrow. So uh, the fact that the sparrow uh, is linked to Aphrodite already makes uh, its egg uh, an appropriate uh, uh, ingredient in um, uh, an aphrodisiac. But uh, in addition to that, sparrows were noted for their frequent uh, sexual copulation and also uh, for the fact that they kissed. So there's a lot of uh, uh, um, descriptions of how the sparrows kiss with the mouth open, so in a way that resembles uh, the way humans kiss. The deer penis uh, is, uh, believe me or not, a relatively common ingredient in ancient medicine, uh, and in particular in uh, women's medicine. Uh, it could be used whole, uh, sometimes as, a, an, as an amulet, uh, or it could be powdered. Uh, and I have uh, put a couple of uh, other examples of, of recipes here. Uh, I won't uh, talk about them in detail, but the, there's an amulet uh, with uh, uh, lovely ingredients uh, such as gazelle leather and uh, uh, the flesh from a hyena's breast. And then uh, you have quite a, an early um, fumigation, uh, where, uh, which is supposed to, to bring fertility. So the stag, too, was uh, uh, known in antiquity uh, to be lustful and, and vigorous, so vigorous, in fact, that the, the hind, the, the, the female deer, uh, sometimes would recoil from, from sex uh, with, with a, a mate. Um, and so, again, uh, this makes it a, a very good uh, ingredient in uh, an aphrodisiac recipe. The use of dung, so uh, of poo, uh, in an aphrodisiac recipe might seem odd, uh, but uh, it's probably included as a fertilizer. So uh, dung is, uh, is good for fertilizing fields, uh, and uh, so it, it, uh, by uh, association it might be also good uh, as uh, an aphrodisiac for, for humans. Uh, but there's also something to be said uh, about the, the blurred boundary between a sexual arousal and uh, disgust. Um, and then a final noteworthy ingredient in our recipe is uh, the, the gecko, uh, which uh, must be live before it's uh, uh, quite horribly steeped uh, in uh, vinegar for, for 40 days. So the gecko is a, a type of lizard 
and uh, allegedly uh, the, the kidneys were particularly uh, aphrodisiac. So uh, Dioscorides tells us that they say that the parts around the kidneys of the gecko uh, in the amount of one drachma drunk with wine uh, has such a sexually stimulating power that the intensity of desire must be checked by drinking a broth of lentils with honey or the seed of lettuce with water. So again, it's a very uh, powerful ingredient, so powerful that you need lettuce to put you to sleep uh, afterwards. And so when you have uh, all those ingredients together in Paul's recipe, so uh, the orchid, the dung, the gecko, uh, the, the deer's penis, the, the sparrow's eggs, uh, you, you get the picture. It, it's uh, it's uh, really, uh, really powerful. So um, I, I'm coming to the end now of, of this talk, and uh, I, I'm not going to fall into the trap of asking whether such, uh, uh, such recipes would have, ha would have had an effect, would have been uh, effective by modern standards. They might have been a little, but that's, that's not the right question to ask. Uh, what, what I want to do is to understand what the ancients were trying to do, so to judge uh, remedies by, uh, ancient remedies by ancient standards. So uh, at a simple level, uh, as I've uh, said before, uh, what the ancients are doing is using similars to treat similars. So they, they're using things that uh, look like uh, uh, sexual things uh, to uh, uh, induce uh, sexual uh, desire. But I think there's a little bit more here at play, uh, things that you need to tease out. Um, and um, I, I think, so I would suggest that uh, the, the main clue to what the ancients are trying to do is really in the name Saturian, so uh, that's the, the satyr's herb. So I want to suggest that the, uh, the Greeks and the Romans used aphrodisiacs to allow civilized humans to be trans, uh, temporarily transformed into hybrid animals. So you can't see, of course, that they've been transformed into animals, but they have taken on the powers of the animal and they become uh, wilder. And then when an aphrodisiac is used on a non-human animal, uh, it allowed them to be transformed into wilder versions of themselves. So what I want to say is that aphrodisiacs enabled a type of temporary metamorphosis. And I was very glad to, to hear that uh, in, uh, in uh, Emmanuel's talk before. One of the key theories uh, in ancient life sciences is that of the great chain of being. Uh, and that was expressed most prominently by uh, the philosopher Aristotle. So according to uh, Aristotle, nature advances step by step from the lifeless, so from the stones at the bottom of the scale, to the, and then you go to the plants, to the non-human animals, and finally to the humans. And at the top you have man, because uh, uh, man is, uh, is superior to, to, to woman. Uh, and in this chain, you have things that uh, scholars call boundary objects. So those are things that don't fall neatly into one category or the other. So a good example is coral, for instance. So uh, coral uh, is, is an animal by modern uh, standards, but for uh, the Greeks and the Romans, it was a plant. So it was uh, a plant that grew under the sea, and when it was pulled out, it would metamorphosize, it would change, uh, into a stone. So these boundary objects, they leave the door open to the scientific possibility of metamorphosis. So now you might say, well, that's what uh, a scientist said, but I, I think that uh, Aristotle uh, and other philosophers were codifying popular views of the natural world and views in which there was fluidity between categories of natural objects and beings <laughs> and where metamorphosis was at least plausible, if not possible. If you search the uh, history of orchids on the internet, uh, it won't be very long before you come across the story of Orchis, the son of the satyr Patalenus and the nymph Acolosia. In this story, Orchis was condemned to death for laying hands on a priestess at a festival of Bacchus, so at a festival of uh, uh, the god of wine. So uh, his father pleaded for Orchis, and the gods compromised uh, by turning him into a flower, the beautiful orchid. The story would not be out of place in Ovid's Metamorphosis, so the, one of the most uh, famous uh, uh, Latin uh, poems, 
Um, but in fact, it is not by Ovid at all. Uh, it's an 18th century creation by the French author Louis uh, Liget, uh, who in his uh, Le Jardinier Fleuriste, uh, a historiographe, uh, which was translated into English in 1706, um, uh, told this, this story. So, as shown by Jim Endersby, who was one of the authors of the books I've shown on, on one of the earlier uh, slides, Liget uh, might have been inspired uh, by uh, stories uh, told in Ovid, uh, and, for, and uh, more particularly uh, by the story of uh, Iacinthus. Uh, so Iacinthus was a young Spartan who uh, was uh, playing with the god Apollo, and they were playing with a discus, uh, and then, um, uh, unfortunately, Iacinthus was hit by the discus, and that killed him. Um, um, but um, um, uh, uh, something good came out of, uh, out of the death uh, because out of his uh, pouring blood, the, the flower hyacinth uh, grew. So there's no uh, beautiful stories like that for, for me to tell uh, about uh, orchids. So uh, this is, this is a, an 18th century invention. There's no ancient precedence. And in fact, there are no beautiful stories for me to tell about uh, <coughs> many of the ingredients I've uh, explored today. What there is, however, is rich cultural connotations uh, attached to these ingredients. Uh, and they too, uh, like the stories of metamorphosis, point to uh, porosity between categories of beings and between culture and wilderness. So in conclusion, uh, aphrodisiacs allow their consumers to uh, temporarily explore their wild side, their more animal side, their madder, crazier side, before withdrawing into the safety of culture, domestication, and sleep. Thank you.